Hi everybody, thanks for joining me. This is an epilogue to the video that you just watched. So I wanted to let you know that it took me several hours of studying the results from that DNA test and um, even though uh, I consider myself really well researched in terms of those tests and videos like this one, um, unfortunately uh, it still took me a lot of time to figure it out. So, um, or fortunately, because I enjoy that sort of thing. I know that I would like to have the same test done uh, using the Ancestry.com uh, version of the test and see what their take on things is. Um, I also know that the uh, Italian Southern uh, European Ancestry that was detected uh, also includes Iberian Peninsula, which uh, goes along with a lot of the things that I research and um, with some of the legends surrounding uh, Ireland and Scotland's formations. I also know that the uh, areas that were indicated in England was primarily around London and up the Thames Rev River as well as being um, around uh, the Northumberland area, um, the old kingdoms of Wessex, Essex, Sussex, um, and a number of others that I have come across in my research um, that come from Lancashire, uh, northern, northern England, but primarily, in particular, Northumberland. So, um, which I'm not very surprised about, um, given the, the names, last names that I've researched. Um, I am a little surprised, uh, that, um, you know, more rural areas of Scotland were not, uh, indicated, um, but, uh, a lot of counties in Ireland were strongly indicated. So I'm very surprised that the removal of uh, many Scottish families was so complete from Scotland. That being said, I also test highly for Glasgow and Edinburgh, um, as well as the 17 counties of Ireland. Um, so that's awesome. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, I have... Um, Westphalian from Texas, uh, they are known as immigrants for, to Texas from places like Indiana, and Indiana was actually kind of similar to Oklahoma once upon a time. It was a Native American reservation in a way. They would trade uh, some of their their land grants would go to natives uh, in order to uh, get them away from communally owning land and more into uh, individualistic ownership of land um, by uh, allowing them a certain amount of land uh, in that area. And then they gradually immigrated down to Texas um, and some of them uh, for, were part of a Westphalian communal religious organization with certain ideals that were involved in agricultural um, stuff in formations of early Texas. Um, there's also a large amount of stuff that I research having to do with North Texas northeastern Texas and, and um, southern Oklahoma area as well as Missouri um, and sort of the movements, uh, the Missouri Wars as well as Mississippi Wars, um, things like that and how this affected the formations of southern Oklahoma and northeastern Texas 
in terms of Chickamauga Cherokee history. Um, I'm not uh, really too surprised about some of my results not having, uh, according to their da database, a lot of Native American and it doesn't really mess with my personal identity at all that it doesn't. Um, I can, uh, through this test, uh, part of the benefits of letting people know so much about your information is that it puts you in touch with friends and cousins and extended family and lets you know how much of a percentage of DNA you have in common. So that's really fascinating. And especially if you're part of a very small group of people, um, like Sardinians, or <laughs> although it doesn't work with them, but Ashkenazis, uh, or um, like any of your heritage, uh, they can put you in touch with some people who share some amount of ancestry, be it second to fifth cousin, usually. Um, <clears throat> So what I've what I've gained through all of this um, is uh, really um, a wonderful sense of certainty uh, through my results. I I it has answered questions I've always had. It also kind of like reinforces um, so much of what I've spent my whole life researching and studying, which is. Uh, early historic um, formations uh, and migrations of peoples, um, the uh, mythology, as it were, of pre-modern Europe and uh, pre-colonial America and that kind of thing. Um, it, it really is uh, fantastic. I can look at these cousins and um, they will have those two or three percent Native American or two or three percent more uh, this, that, or the other, um, you know, African American ancestry or African ancestry, um, those sorts of uh, um, the components. And, um, you know, I can, I can say, uh, you know, I have this certain amount of a very mad mixture that and and no one else has quite that admixture in the entire universe um, so that's kind of fascinating it's also very fascinating uh, to know more about the uh, Sardinian people because the Sardinian people apparently they established a genetic bank in Sardinia so that they could study a specific a longevity gene and they ran across um, all they ran through all of the population of Sardinia and um, they um, basically uh, compared their their cross population of Sardinia to ancient uh, ice mummies and ancient uh, Europeans that they have found, like Atsi the Iceman and other ancient peoples, and they they share a huge, like 75% similarity to Europeans of 6,000 years ago. Um, and that's a, a wonderful thing. It can uh, tell us quite a bit about um, it also lends itself to a specific type of immune system and this immune system basically it allows people to live on average to about 120 um, and Sardinia is very beautiful it does not seem like a very industrialized stress-filled environment let's just say I, I think that it probably lends itself well to living to 120 and these genetics kind of seem to play a part. Um, so that's very fascinating. Uh, I also learned that the Ashkenazi Jewish population has experienced um, more than just one holocaust 
in its uh, history, and so there are these genetic bottlenecks that have occurred specifically in the early Middle Ages. And so um, it is thought by scholars that uh, all of the Ashkenazi Jewish population originated from 350 uh, Ashkenazi Jews from Northern Europe. Um, who, who migrated to Northern Europe through uh, current Venice, Venice, Italy, um, which was at that time the uh, gateway to uh, Eastern Europe for Ashkenazi Jewry uh, through, from the North Africa and Mediterranean to Venice and from there through to Eastern Europe. Now, I was expecting all of my life that I would have an admixture of Eastern European, Belarusian, Lithuanian, R Russian, uh, but no, Ashkenazi Jewish people are not limited to just one location uh, geographically. In fact, um, not myself, unfortunately, however, cousins can be traced all the way back to uh, specifically North India, Northern India, Western China, specifically the Han peoples, and um, also to uh, Pakistan, current day Pakistan, which is formerly the Punjab. And um, they can, uh, they have an admixture of Western Asian. Uh, which sweeps through as well as North African, um, sometimes uh, Egyptian is, is not uncommon, um, and Moroccan, that sort of admixture. Even, uh, even uh, Nigerian, Ethiopian in some cases. So, so distant cousins have some of these admixtures. I've noticed it particularly with male distant cousins that, that more of the the Y chromosome seems to carry more of the Western Asian through, um, which I think is interesting. Uh, also, Jewish scholars totally don't believe that the Khazars like any, have anything to do with anything, and they never really converted to Judaism. They didn't supply some, some of the DNA. Uh, Ashkenazi Jews are definitely not Khazars or Tartars or um, particularly Huns, uh, so all of that. But they, they can be traced to 350 early Middle Ages Jews who lived in Europe and settled there. And why did they settle? Because, well, apparently Eastern Europe did not have plague. They did not suffer plague as much as Venice. Venice kind of suffered plague so badly that they there is some discussion that the plague was actually shipped all over Europe from Venice through the ports there. So, um, uh, also, um, the rats. Apparently the fleas couldn't travel on the rats the same way in Eastern Europe. It, it just, that, that life cycle didn't happen, so maybe they didn't have as much standing water as well. Um, and it's mighty cold that tends to freeze bacteria. So anyway, uh, those 350 uh, made their way to Eastern Europe. Um, and uh, I also uh, understand, I got some feedback from, you know, cousins in Belarus and Lithuania, but not that many, and a lot more in London, and then uh, I think everybody made it in the, the Holocaust of the Second World War, a lot of people, not everybody, but uh, some, some people made it to London and from there found uh, like fanned out to other places throughout the globe. Um, the, the people we can find today. So, 
Um, I'm interested in doing the Ancestry.com one. It will be a different bat database. It will give different results. It tabulates its geographic regions very differently. And um, the, the uh, um, I, I was expecting more diversity in terms of where it said I was from. Um, like for example Switzerland or France it did identify me as being part of Appalachian settlers however it, it didn't really tabulate anything like Melingen or um, southern uh, southern settlers or early pioneers of Texas or you know any of the other number of things it could say um, so, uh, I have run across a lot of stories in my genealogical research. I really was looking forward to this test telling me what I could kind of rely on as being true about those fascinating stories. And these aren't just mythological folk tales that were told to me um, as bedtime stories. These are things that I like. I and others for generations have researched and gathered paperwork about and retold and thought about um, to the point of madness. <laughs> um, anyway, so so I have been very curious for a long time what what the test would say, and I was kind of curious, you know, oh. The Finland part, they're not regular Finlanders. In fact, it's its Sami people, which is kind of neat. Um, so early, early Laplanders, Sami. Uh, and apparently the Sami are no longer uh, their distinct own community there. There, there isn't a, a pure-blood Sami influence in the same way, but these are prehistoric Laplanders. So I'm very proud to have a trace amount of Sami. And, uh, um, you know, and, and I think that it's interesting to be part of the Venetian tradition and to be part of, of some West African tradition and West, West Asian tradition. I, I think that that's fantastic. Um, and I think that it's very interesting to, uh, be more in touch with my UK, Irish, Scottish side, uh, English side, and to try and delve more into that history um, in, a, in a more ancient way. And that really fascinates me. So um, I'm also very interested in uh, the the specific dynamics of Westphalian Texan air influence and even though this test didn't have a lot of Native American for me and it has some percentages for cousins and stuff that really doesn't influence anything about the way I see being part of that culture for a lot of reasons not the least of which is that tribe tribal adoptions and tribal marriages and tribal communal involvement really doesn't have anything to do with a specific DNA or genetic signature and this is like even legally stated um, as part of uh, precedent in both tribal courts as well as international national courts so it really doesn't change my perspective of anything or anybody's identity all the way through my family charts because the what they wrote on their census was just a reflection of the times they lived in and what identities they assumed at that point. And America is about, um, in its essence to me, I. It's about creating and establishing your own identity. And so 
my ancestors established their identity based on their influences at the time. And those identities may not be in a database which was established 10 years ago and that is purely reliant on people's donations to make that up. Like, there aren't a lot of really insular people who feel totally comfortable with making a video like this and donating publicly to a genetic database and getting uh, and establishing their identity as like, yo, this is how I have my whole thing structured. Um, it's, I, I think that there's, this is skewed and that all results will always be skewed in their, you know, by, by some people have a history of not wanting to publicly be identified with whatever out of self-protection and um, they, some people have been traumatized and they don't want to know, you know, or, or whatever with their histories. So I really, um, some, there may even be databases that I don't know about that people contribute to and find out all this stuff and they just don't contribute to this one because it's not, uh, what their whole family does. Uh, it doesn't survey that group that way. So, you know, there are a lot of surveys still out. They're still doing demographics on the people, and uh, I understand that they have um, like mitochondrial groups established A, B, C, D, and X for Native Americans. Mine is H, so maybe we'll get around to European H1 mitochondria at some future video. Um, and that's kind of interesting in and of itself. Um, this mitochondria is found in, in the general European population, but it's also found as a native mitochondria in Ashkenazi Jewish populations as well. So, um, anyway, uh, I think that all of us have something really, really, you know, that we can get into and that's interesting about our specific makeup and I am happy to have done this test and to be sharing these results with you and what I've found and uh, thank you for sitting this long through it and I'll be continuing to look into all of these things. Um, the Italian also uh, comes uh, from that Irish Scots from my father's side, so that's kind of fascinating. And um, I think that uh, I will, I know that his father's family um, were French, but they spent about a thousand years in London and around England and that kind of thing from the time of William the Conqueror. So according to this, this study, then, um, you know, now they test as you're from London, they're, they're English at this point in history. So I can totally get it why people like, they, they can spend a long time puzzling over these results and just totally think this thing is like baloney and how much does this have to do with them and stuff. But uh, there's one thing that I have a chip on my shoulder about from watching all of those DNA videos and I just want to air it right now. There's, there's a bunch of genealogy videos, uh, especially about DNA testing where the guy's like psycho and he's like you're potentially 
you know, testing, you've got potentially this many relatives. And he does this math, this crazy math, where he's like, okay, you start off with your two parents, and you've got four grandparents, right? And then you have eight great grandparents and then you have 16 great great grandparents and and by now there's like 500 people and they're all related to your same 16 great great grandparents and and that means that that like you're not an individual past any of those other people because you're like all clones of those one 16 people and and they're like those 16 people are clones of the 32 people who were their parents who now we're talking about like you're related to half the western united states and like everybody's an eighth cousin and like you can't marry anybody who's like you know your your fifth or above you know under cousin or fifth cousin because that's kind of weird and and everybody's your eighth cousin and and at a certain point your dna just doesn't even matter because like you're 10 percent that's similar to your cousins and 25 percent similar to your siblings and and look dude <laughs> i'm sorry i went off on a tangent i could make it way worse i mean these people are nuts. All right. Look, there are documents past 150 years ago. You can go find them. They are listed. They're alphabetized. They're transcribed into multiple languages. Okay. There are no mysteries. Even in prehistory, you can figure stuff out through censuses and tertiary information and secondary sources okay so these guys who are like oh your genealogy you're not gonna find anything good luck though glad you have a hobby and let me produce 60 videos on how to research your tree but by the way none of those people really matter in the long scheme of things because it takes 1500 ancestors to even make you up and you're never going to find any like actual tangible links to individuals and a bunch of other stuff why is everybody so disheartening why why doesn't why don't people say yeah you know cool you're researching some ancestors and you found like a lot of like really good solid evidence and you worked your way around all these mysteries good for you and you worked on a way to present it that's awesome and you know and by the way yeah you're totally related to like at least people who are six who are three generations back you know that's not unreasonable you're totally related to great great grandparents and they were totally related to great great grandparents they're like amalgams of great great grandparents it's cool but it's not exactly you get a 16th from so and so you could get 30 percent from so and so and two percent from so and so okay and your sibling even your fraternal twin can get a surprise five percent you didn't get from so-and-so you know that's just the way it works and it's kind of neat that way you know that that somebody you know that you can be related to one great great grandparent and another cousin can be related to a totally different great great grandparent and you have that amount in common and that much different is kind of neat but you know that potential to make friends and have a uh, similarity um, because those people knew each other and they liked each other and you kind of have different parts of those two people that's kind of neat that you would like each other more based on that so anyway um, in terms of the health thing don't worry about it I got a mild propensity to diabetes type 2 but um, you know, so send me money for food. Uh, manja, manja, I like to eat out. Would you pay for my breakfast, please? That'd be awesome. <laughs> um, and let's see. Um, but I didn't find out anything else in particular. Uh, slightly increased risk for a couple of things. Um, 
you know, but uh, I think that that's good to know in advance so I can improve my nutrition and work towards that. So, um, for the most part, pretty good and nothing to be afraid of. Uh, a lot of people are very afraid of that portion and, and I think it's better to know in advance um, what it says, but I'm not entirely convinced that that portion is going to actually tell you anything like cold hard truth. You know what I'm saying? It's not a medical thing. It's a hobby thing. It's, it's a cute diversion kind of thing. It's not administered by a you know, medical doctor. So, you know, just accept what it is, which is pop science and move on. You know, what it does is what it does and that's cool. Um, I did research some interesting stuff that like there were some Ashkenazi Jews and they got kicked out of uh, Rome. Um, but they were the Chaldeans and they got kicked out of Rome and got sent over to fight in Sardinia <laughs> and um, then from Sardinia uh, they they seem to have migrated to Eastern Europe and they eventually uh, t and they took the um, Kabbalah with them and uh, then they eventually became the Hasidic sect uh, and um, then eventually they were, were sent their children out of Eastern Europe because of the pogroms to America and um, some of them did not remain Hasidic uh, and even if they were Orthodox they some of them also left the Orthodox community and were more reformed and became more part of American culture in the odd case. So um, such was the case of my grandfather who is a fascinating person to me um, because he grew up very much in um, Yiddish culture and in Hasidic culture and uh, Orthodox culture in uh, the USA um, and then uh, died very young uh, in the war. Uh, he left all of that background to um, fight in World War II and married a woman who was not uh, part of that Jewish background and she left her background for a small amount of time to be married to him. Um, and I find that very fascinating. I also find her background very fascinating. And it is through her that I'm related very strongly to southern Oklahoma and northern Texas and back through to Tennessee, Chickamauga, Cherokees. Um, so, and there is some discussion about Jews and Cherokees and whether Cherokees have some Jewish ancestry. And um, Chief Sitting Owl and also Chief Bowles uh, also comes into this because he's an ancestor and that sort of thing. So Chief Sitting Owl is a guy who had his, he's part of an Eastern band, but they are not recognized necessarily as an established band like the other three bands of Cherokee. Um, but the Cherokee themselves <laughs> are kind of like, hey, we're, we're cool with our own, no matter which Eastern, Western, or Central band you're with. Um, anyway, so they did some tests and not a lot of Jewish Ashkenazi admixture came back from Chief Sitting Owl, but I have 27% thereabouts of Ashkenazi, so that means that I've got a little skosh from someplace else other than Eastern Europe and that grandfather, um, possibly, or maybe I just have a very strong amount from his side. 
we're just not sure. But it's kind of intriguing because of this, um, I've always heard of like Ivanhoe and it has to do with um, somehow Jews in Scotland. Okay, I, I know, but certainly the myth of Skoda and stuff talks a lot about the Old Testament. Those guys are definitely Jewish. So there's Enoch, I mean, you know. And I'm not trying to, like, really get out there. I mean, there's a lot we could go with with this. All right, I'm going to cut it off here because already this follow-up video is, like, insane. All right, take care. And thank you so much for liking, subscribing, and patroning my videos. It means the world to me. And I swear I'll do a tarot reading soon. Happy holidays and peace I appreciate all your support and I really appreciate you tuning in. Take care. Bye.